Your Honor, calling people versus Jennifer Crumbly, case number 22279-990 on page. Calling people versus James Crumbly, case number 22279-989 FH. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Karen McDonald on behalf of the people. Thank you, Mark Keyes on behalf of the people. Good morning, Your Honor. David Williams on behalf of the people. Good morning, Your Honor. I'm Shannon Smith on behalf of Jennifer Crumbly, who sits to my right. Good morning, Your Honor. Marielle Lehman on behalf of James Crumbly, who is seated to my left. Good morning. Um, I see that your client has the hearing device that we've provided. He does, Your Honor. Is, is that working appropriately for you, Mr. Crumbly? Yes, can you, Your Honor. Can you hear? If for some reason you can't hear, we have a number of those on the courthouse. So if there's some reason you can't hear, please uh, let your counsel know. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm going to ask um, Mr. and uh, Mrs. Crumley um, each to raise your right hand. Can you raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth to help you God? Yes. Um, you can put your hand down. Uh, would you state your name? Jennifer Crumley. And your name. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm aware that um, your attorneys now operate separate. Um, in separate spaces, but just out of an abundance of caution, I'm going to ask you the questions that um, I asked previously about joint uh, on the joint representation uh, waiver form. Right? Um, for, you already stated your name. Your name, how old are you? Uh, 44. Mr. Cummings? 46. Um, can you read, write, and understand the English language? Yes. Yes. Could you hear and understand your attorney? Yes. Yes. Um, and are you satisfied with their advice? Yes. Yes. Um, do you understand that you're each charged with four counts of involuntary manslaughter? Yes. Yes. Do you understand you have a right to have your, uh, your own attorney and conflict-free representation? Yes. Yes. Do you understand that there are various risks related to joint representation, which can include the following? Joint representation can compel a lawyer to refrain from taking certain courses of action before trial, during trial and even after trial at sentencing. Do you understand that? Yeah. I do yeah. understand. And joint representation can affect advice regarding the decision to plea, plea negotiations themselves, and, de and decisions during jury selection. Because a lawyer will have the duty of loyalty to both clients, the lawyer may not be able to suggest or take courses of action that would benefit one client or hurt the other. This duty of loyalty could prevent counsel from pointing out the differences between the client's culpability and potential Plea negotiations or at sentencing. Uh, in making comparis uh, comparisons between the two clients, it could put one client at a disadvantage. Do you understand that? Yes. Yeah. I do understand that. Yes. Uh, the duty of loyalty to both clients can affect uh, counsel's decisions regarding matters of trial state strategy. For example, it could limit the presentation of evidence, the examination of witnesses, or even the decision to call witnesses in an effort to protect the other client. As such, in the examination of witnesses, counsel may not be able to ask a question that would help one client but hurt the other. The duty of loyalty to both clients could also prevent counsel from pointing out the differences between the evidence against them or from objecting to the admission of certain evidence as to one client. That is, arguing that certain evidence does not apply to one client can highlight its impact as to the other client. Being duty-bound to protect the interests of the other client can prevent counsel from being able to present a defense that implicates the other client. Do you understand that? Yes. 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 There may be situations where counsel cannot effectively assist one client due, the, due to the necessity to protect the other. For example, if your co-defendant chooses to testify, your attorney may not be able to cross-examine them on any testimony that may implicate you or challenge your co-defendant's credibility. Do you understand that? Yes. And do you understand that? Yes. A lawyer has the duty to preserve, to preserve their client's confidences and secrets. And either that duty may become compromised in the situation of joint representation, or counsel may not be able to share certain facts with one of the clients. Do you understand that? Yes. And do yes. Have you had the opportunity to consult with your retained counsel as it relates to the issue of joint representation? Yes. yes. Have you been given the opportunity to, to consult with indep independent appointed counsel regarding joint representation and the potential for conflicts of interest? Yes. Yes. Do you, do you at this moment have it, any further interest in discussing anything with independent counsel? No, Your Honor. No. Um, having been given the opportunity for such consultation and understanding the risks, do you wish to present to uh, proceed with joint representation? Yes. Yes. Do you understand that your attorney will not be able to act as a witness? Yes. Yes. 
you understand that by entering the waiver, you will not be able to raise these issues in appeal should you be convicted? Yes. Yes. I, I believe I've supplied um, this form to, to each. Um, to each. Um, and did you, did they complete oh, those forms? I'm sorry, Your Honor, we did not see those. We did not get oh, any of those. I think we put them out and then decided to not put them out till this morning just because um, they come in here and clean, so. All right. Um, they have uh, paper and pencil. They do, Your Honor. Okay. Yes, thank you, Judge. All right. <coughs> All right. Um, there's not the necessity for any kind of cycle, right? No. Okay. Um, and this is a hearing pursuant to uh, Daubert. Um, did you want to make a brief opening or not? I read. I, yes, Your Honor, if I may. Okay. Any other issues before that? Anything else? Oh, Your Honor, I think the only other issue, and maybe we can talk about this at the end of the hearing, is that third expert that was added on um, in the issue, the prosecution submitted an affidavit in lieu of testimony, and we would just object to that being a part of this hearing. I don't know if the court wants to take that up now or later. Um, if, if they attempt to introduce it, you can object at that time, probably. I got a motion for reconsideration. Um, I think you've um, filed a motion for reconsideration prior to me issuing the scheduling order on Monday or they passed in the system, but um, we didn't see the motion for reconsideration until yesterday. Um, I will probably eventually rule on that. I think this hearing will take care of a lot of the issues that were Thank you, Judge. raised. Thank you, Judge. We're prepared to address that issue at the end of the hearing after the first two witnesses. Uh, Judge, there are a total of seven exhibits. Um, in the exhibit book, they're numbered one through eight. There is no six. My understanding is the defense uh, will stipulate the admission of one five and that they're going to contest seven and eight, which relate to the third expert. Okay, so there's a there's a exhibit one through five and you stipulate to one through five. Correct, Your Honor. So exhibit one uh, is CB and uh, Dr. Peterson, correct? Exhibit two appears to be a report or a letter from the violence project. Is this correct? That's Dr. Peterson's report, Your Honor. Okay. Um, three is um, CV of Dr. Cornell. Yes, Your Honor. Four is, um, I believe, a document um, authored uh, by the shooter. Yes, Your Honor. That's what we would call the original school drawing. Okay, that's exhibit four. Yes, Your Honor. And exhibit five is another drawing from the shooter. Correct? We put it as a modified, the amended uh, school drawing, Your Honor. Okay. Okay, so those are exhibits one through five, and um, you stipulate to the admission of those exhibits? We do for the purpose of this hearing, thank you. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, so one through five are admitted, um, seven and eight um, have to be determined, right? Yes, Your Honor. Yeah. Go ahead. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. School shootings can be prevented. They are utterly preventable. It's a hard thing to hear after children have died. We would much rather believe that there's nothing we could have done. It's a hard thing to hear because it forces us to look at ourselves and the people around us and ask, what could we have done and what should we have done? It's hardest of all on the parents whose children were killed because if school shootings are preventable, it means their child didn't have to die. And so all of us have told ourselves a story, the story that shooters just snap and that these things can't be prevented. It's easier to believe that, and we've said it for so long, we do believe it, but it's not true. Mass shootings are not inevitable. We are not helpless, and we don't have to just live with them. They are preventable. That's what decades of research into hundreds of shootings shows. So during this case, we'll have to decide whether the Oxford High School shooting could have been prevented, and ultimately, whether these defendants could have prevented it. As long as they hold that myth that there's nothing we can do and that shooters just snap, the jury can't fairly assess those two questions. They need to know the real facts. They need to hear from experts who have seen this pattern over and over and over again. Judge, this is an emotionally charged case. Four children died. It's tempting to litigate the question whether these defendants could have prevented this shooting today to make that part of this hearing. But that's for a jury to decide. That's for another day. The only two questions today 
are whether the expert testimony and data underlying them are sufficiently reliable and whether that testimony will assist the jury in deciding this case. In their most recent filings, the defense has indicated that they don't intend to argue that the shooter just snapped. That might be a matter of semantics, whether they use the word snapped or not, the defendants have repeat, repeatedly claimed that quote, the last thing they expected was that a school shooting would take place. This case clearly involves a young man who was not on any person's radar to be a threat to himself or any person. Everyone involved was shocked and surprised, including Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly. No one expected that the shooter <coughs> could or would be homicidal and it, it goes on and on. Those are all just different ways of saying that the shooter just snapped and that no one, including them, could have prevented this. But ultimately it doesn't matter whether the defense argues that or not, because it's a common misconception and jurors believe it. A second ago, I said that the jury needs to hear this evidence. And I do believe that, but that's not the standard. It's not whether they need to hear that evidence, but whether the jury ought to hear it, whether they deserve to hear it and then make their own judgment. Your Honor, after you've heard our experts testify today, I don't think you'll have any doubt whatsoever that these opinions and the data underlying them are completely reliable and well-founded. And I hope and will ask you to conclude that the jury deserves to hear them. Thank you. Would the defense like to make anything? Very great, Your Honor. Sure. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. As the defense has indicated, we don't dispute that the experts that are being called today are experts in their chosen field. What we do dispute, Your Honor, is the reliability, reliability of their studies as they relate to this case, the relevancy of their conclusions as they relate to this case, and whether or not their testimony would assist a trier of fact. And the defense position, Your Honor, Mr. Crumbly's position, is that the testimony of these potential experts would not assist the trier of fact because their conclusions are not relevant in this case. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. No, thank you. I will rely on co-counsel. Thank you. All right, who's the first witness? Thank you, it's Dr. Jillian Peterson. Can you raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give? Is it yourself? You got it. All right, um, you may be seated. And then, would you state your name for the record as well? Yes, it's Jillian Peterson, J I L L I A N P E T E R S O N. All right, go ahead, Mr. Peterson. Thank you, Judge. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> now, I just want to ask before we get into your report and your CV, um, how long have you been an academic researcher? since I started graduate school back in 2009. And how long have you researched specific to mass shootings? About five years. I'm gonna ask you just to keep your voice nice and loud for us, okay? Okay. Now, what has the research shown? In studying mass shooters, we've found that there is a consistent pathway up to a mass shooting that Mass shooters have a slow build towards violence over time. They don't just snap and they give off lots of warning signs along that pathway. Now, Dr. Peterson, do you testify often? I've never testified before, no. Okay, and in fact, um, you're a professional researcher, is that correct? That's correct. You're a professor? Yes. And please tell the court what you do. I am a professor of criminology and criminal justice at Hamlin University, and I also am co-president of a nonprofit called The Violence Project. Now, we'll get into the Violence Project in detail in a few minutes, but I want to ask you for more questions about your background. Sure. Where were you educated? I did my undergraduate degree in sociology at Grinnell College in Iowa, and I got my PhD at the University of California, Irvine. Did you have any specializations in your PhD program? Yes, my PhD is in psychology and social behavior with an emphasis in psychology and law and psychopathology. How long have you been at Hamlin University? Since 2015. What roles have you held there? I started as an assistant professor of criminology and then moved to an associate professor of criminology. And I'm also the director of the forensic psychology program there. Can you tell the court, please, what brought you to Hamlin to begin with? I wanted a position in the Twin Cities. I was interested in teaching at a small liberal arts college, and I was excited about teaching forensic psychology classes. Have you taught anywhere else in your career? I have, yes. 
we're at. When I was writing my dissertation, I worked as an adjunct at Normandale Community College, McAllister College, and St. Catherine University. And then I held permanent positions at Normandale and at Metropolitan State University before coming to Hamlin. And what departments did you teach in? I was in either psychology or criminal justice. Have you always been a professor? No. Can you tell the court please what you did out of college? Yes, I started off my career as a mitigation specialist. I worked for the New York Capitol Defender's Office. What exactly does a mitigation specialist do? I developed what we call the psychosocial life histories of our clients who are facing the death penalty that were used in their sentencing schemes. So I spent time interviewing perpetrators, talking to people who knew them, and then gathering records about their lives. How long did you work at that office? I was there around two and a half years. And why did you leave? New York got rid of the death penalty, so they closed the office. Okay. What did you decide to do after New York abolished the death penalty? I could see in doing that work the consistent pathways to violence in our clients' lives. And I could see all the places along that pathway that intervention might have prevented the murder. And so I didn't want to work at that final stage anymore. I wanted to go into actually preventing violence from occurring. So that's why I went to graduate school. Okay. And that's where you obtained your master's as well as PhD? Yes. What was your master's in? My master's is in social ecology from the same university. Now, you mentioned when we talked about your um, experience as a researcher. So do you um, uh, research at, at Hamlin University? Yes. Okay, tell me please what you do. Um, at Hamlin University, my research is largely focused on mass shootings. Okay. And have you you've been involved in scholarly research at other universities? I have, yes. Prior to my focus on mass shootings, my research was really focused on the complicated relationship between mental illness and climate violence. Now, we'll get into the fact that you study primarily mass shootings in a few minutes, but if you could tell the court, please, as a academic researcher, do you seek to publish your findings? Yes. Can you tell the court, please, what is the process behind publishing findings? So we can publish findings in what's called a peer-reviewed journal. Um, that process is writing up your findings, doing a literature review, writing up your methodology, your results, and your conclusions, including limitations of the study, submitting that to a journal where it goes out to typically three peer reviewers who are experts in the field. They provide feedback and tell the journal either accept, reject, or revise. Okay. Have you publish any peer-reviewed works? I have, yes. How many? Um, about 20. No. In looking at your CV that's been um, admitted to this court, I have a copy if, if you need to see a copy. Um, I see about nine pages of published articles, chapters, and books. Does that sound right? Yes. I can go through them all one by one because the court has accepted the exhibit. Um, but I do want to ask you this. Have you published any work specific to mass shooting prevention? Yes. How many? Three peer-reviewed journal articles, a book, and about 40 other published essays. Okay. Now, you mentioned that you primarily research mass shootings at the moment, is that right? Yes. Was there a shift at some point from your study of mental illness and the intersection of mental illness with crime to mass shootings in particular? Yeah, around 2017, um, it really was my interest in mental illness and violence that got me interested in mass shootings because that was something that was coming up in our public discourse quite a bit. And I realized that there was no information about what percentage of shooters had a mental health history, for example. It was also right around the time of the shooting, which was the most challenging. And so it was that I switched my focus, understanding the life histories of perpetrators in mass shootings. Why was it important to you as a social scientist to understand the life histories of perpetrators of mass shootings? I think there's a couple reasons. One is that we didn't have a lot of data around who these perpetrators were. And because we didn't have that data, we couldn't have public policy conversations grounded in that data. So when we would say things like, this is caused by violent video games, we didn't know what percentage of shooters were playing violent video games. Also, when you deeply understand that life history and that pathway to violence, that's when you can start building really data-driven prevention strategies. So rather than just minimizing casualties after it's happened, how do we prevent it from happening in the first place? Now, just so we're clear, in your research, were you able to determine if mass shootings were in fact preventable? Yes. Could you tell the court, please, what exactly is a quote-unquote mass shooting? 
it depends on who you ask. There's various definitions. In my work, I follow the Congressional Research Service definition, which is four or more people killed, not including the perpetrator in a public space. Um, the victims are non-family and it's not in the course of other underlying criminal activity. And this is the same definition used by the FBI, is that correct? Correct. Now, when you shifted into the study of mass shooting prevention, did you have a name for the study? Yes, we called it the Violence Project. Okay, you said that started 2017? Yes. So tell me how that started. It started with me, um, my research partner, James Densley at Metropolitan State University and a group of undergraduate students at Hamlin. And we started by putting together a list of every perpetrator we could find who killed four or more people according to that definition going back to 1966. Let's talk about the definition. So four or more uh, individual individuals killed, not including the shooter, not related, um, not related to the shooter and not secondary to another crime. Is that what that's okay. Okay. So this started through um, the Hamlin University? Yes. Okay. And at this point, did you have any federal funding? No, we started out all volunteering on the project. At some point, were you made aware of a potential grant from the Department of Justice? Yes. In 2018, the National Institute of Justice put out a call for proposals for studies focused on firearm violence and specifically mass shootings. Now, tell me, please, what was the goal of the study to begin with? Our goal of the study was twofold. One, to add data to our public policy conversations to ground those so we could come up with better solutions moving forward and two to figure out if we could find ways to prevent this from happening if we could find a common pathway then perhaps we could build some prevention strategies so tell me about the grant process award from the department of justice yeah we put together about a 50 page proposal which details what's known about mass shootings what's unknown what we would do in our project what it would add details from the timeline and tasks and methodology. We submitted that first to Hamlin University. It has to go through a review process. So it's reviewed by the dean and the provost and the president. We then submit it to the National Institute of Justice where it's reviewed by a series of experts who give it a score. Would it be fair to say that this proposal is thoroughly vetted? Yes. <laughs> are these grant awards competitive? They are, yes. You said it's through what, what department? The National Institute of Justice. And what is that? That is the research arm of the Department of Justice. And what exactly did you propose you study through this grant award? We proposed that we were going to build a database of all mass shooters meeting that definition. We were going to code them on a series of life history variables and look for patterns in the data. We also said we were going to conduct interviews with perpetrators, with people who knew perpetrators, parents, siblings, old social workers, also victims, survivors, and experts in the field. And then we were gonna disseminate the results and make sure that the results were accessible to the public. Okay, and we'll go through all those steps. I just wanna ask you before we get too uh, far down, how far back did the study propose to go? We started with the year 1966. And why 1966? We started with the Texas Bell Tower shooting, which is kind of commonly regarded as the first public mass shooting. There was mass shootings before then, but that was the first one that was live streamed on television, so people watched it. So if I'm understanding you correctly, your proposed sample size was every single mass shooting that fits the FBI's definition and the congressional research definition in 1966 on? Correct, yes. And when the federal government sanctions an award for a research study, is there a certain oversight that goes with it? There is, yes. Can you tell the court about that, please? Yes, we first had to go through an institutional review board to get ethical clearance to do the study. We had to submit progress reports to the National Institute of Justice every six months. And then we had to submit a larger report when the study was finished, including all of our data. Did the National Institute of Justice sanction your research and your findings every step along the way? Yes. Okay. And how long was the a grant award for? It was three years. And at the end of the three years, what happened? At the end of the three years, we submitted our final report with all of our findings and the National Institute of Justice accepted that and actually chose to write their own article about the project, including their own press release. Now you mentioned the uh, the methodology behind the violence project. If we could go through those step by step, I think you said step one was to identify the mass shootings. 
Yes. Tell me what that process entailed. We used um, publicly available records. We used previous um, databases and lists of mass shootings and gathered every perpetrator we could find who met our definition. Okay. And how long did that process take? Um, a few months at the beginning. Once you identified the sample size and you identified all of the, the mass shootings, first of all, tell the court, please, how many were there that you studied? 185 mass shooters of 181 shootings. And was that the number you knew of in 2017 or the number you know of now? That's now. Okay, so the Violence Project, is it fair to say it continues in its research even after the grant award um, and its completion? Yes, we've been continuing to update the database every six months or so. Okay, I'm sorry, can you tell me? 185 mass shooters and 181 mass shootings. Yes, so four shootings had more than one perpetrator. So step two was building the database, is that right? Correct. And what does that entail? So we started off by making a list of every variable we wanted to code, so every piece of information. We looked at previous literature, we looked at public policy conversations, we looked at known risk factors for violence and for self-harm. So everything from basic demographic variables, um, early childhood, history of crime and violence, mental health history, anything that we could think of, we put as a variable. So it was started out of about 50 variables. Once we got the funding, we expanded to 150 variables. It's now 188 variables. Why do the variables expand? Partially because we discovered new things in the course of our coding. Also, as we have made the data public, researchers and scholars make suggestions to us for additional variables we could add and we take those into account. Now you mentioned that making your findings public was an important part of the violence project. It was. Why? This was meant to be a public criminology project. So this was not something that we wanted to publish in a journal article and lock behind a paywall. We wanted this to be used. We wanted this data to be accessible to policymakers, to journalists, to concerned citizens. Um, something that we could really use when we're talking about this issue that could help us move forward. Okay. Now I imagine that it wasn't just identifying the shootings and the shooters, making a database and then publishing. There, there was analysis as well, is that right? That's correct. And what was the analysis looking for? Well, initially to fill in the database, we started by assigning every shooter to two separate coders who were highly trained. So each perpetrator was coded twice. We then reconciled those and any differences, um, either I or Dr. James Densley would reconcile using the information available. We then had a coder check it the third time, and then we had a database manager go through every cell a fourth time before it was made public. Okay. Um, then to look for patterns in the data, we used statistical analysis to see what variables came up uh, most frequently. Okay. Now, you mentioned that it wasn't just looking at information available, but it was also conducting your own investigation. Correct. Okay. Tell me, tell me about that, please. So we, this is what's called a mixed method study. We had the quantitative component, which is gathering publicly available information, turning in it, that into numeric codes that you can run analysis on. We also had a qualitative component which was gathering kind of the deeper stories behind this, case studies, if you will. So we wrote to every living perpetrator of a mass shooting that we could identify in prison. Um, seven of them agreed to be interviewed. We were able to interview five. We also interviewed about 50 other people, parents, siblings, old social workers, old teachers, who could tell us about the psychosocial life history of the perpetrator. Why, how many were living that you we could, well, most perpetrators die in the course of their shooting. So of the 185, we were able to send letters to 30. So how many were 100 were alive and you send letters to 30? We sent everybody alive, so 30 were alive. Okay. And the rest were either died by suicide or by uh, gunfire with the police? Now, what did you do with these these first person accounts with the interviews that you did? Well, first of all, let me ask you this. Aside from just writing to the perpetrators and mass shootings to interview uh, those individuals, what else did you do? Um, we interviewed anybody who we could find who had known a perpetrator. We also interviewed victims and survivors and also first responders. Okay. And what was the intent of doing this extra investigatory stuff? Um, the goal of a mixed method study is to have the 
quantitative statistical data, but to also have these sort of personal narratives that help bring the data alive, help you have ideas for what patterns to look for. In this case, it also helped us verify that data we were getting from publicly available information. So we could look at, do these first person accounts match up with the data in our database? And what did you discover? We discovered that it didn't match up. Uh, this doesn't seem <coughs> unlike the work you did with um, the New York Defender's Office, is that right? It's similar in the sense of building these psychosocial life histories, yes. So that's step one and step two. And now step three, we'll get back to the patterns. But step three would be to make the information public. Yes, so we built a website where we put some of the main findings on the website and then we made the full database fully downloadable for free. Okay, and has, has anyone downloaded it? Yes. How many, if you know? The last I checked, it was about 3,000 downloads. Did you make your research and your findings available for other researchers in the field of mass violence prevention and threat assessment? Yes. To your knowledge, has anyone cited to that in support of their own studies? Yes, the last time I looked, it had been cited around 51 times in peer-reviewed journal articles. And that's just peer-reviewed articles, correct? Correct. Now, why was it important for you to not just report back to the National Institute of Justice, but actually publish to the public? I wanted to see the data used. I, the goal of this project was to make a difference. The goal of this project was to prevent violence. Now you mentioned the public discourse back when you were talking about your shift from the research just in the mental illness and crime into mass shootings back in 2017. Um, did you note something about the public discourse that caused you to want to build life histories and to examine life histories? I just noticed the lack of data that we were really operating on a lot of assumptions, on a lot of fear, or on single case studies. What sort of assumptions? assumptions around things like the perpetrator just snaps or a psychotic episode causes violence when we really didn't have any evidence that that was true. So when you went into this, you didn't, there was no database to show if that was true or not true, would that be right? There was databases that counted mass shootings that had basic demographic information, but none that did this deeper dive into the psychosocial life histories. And as you mentioned earlier, you did find that a mass shooter has a slow buildup to the final event, is that right? Correct. Now, the, you mentioned the National Institute of Justice. They also published the findings and made it public. They did. Okay. And in fact, you authored a book on the subject? I did. And what's the book called? It's called The Violence Project. Did you seek to publish that in an academic press or other means? I chose not to go with an academic press, again, because I didn't want just academics to read this book. So we went with a <laughs> traditional trade publisher so that we could reach a wider audience of parents, teachers, law enforcement, sort of anyone who could use the findings. So the... The Violence Project was to obtain data and to analyze data, is that right? Correct. And to try to identify if there are methods to, or opportunities to intervene. Right. And to identify if, in fact, mass shooters do not snap. Right. Okay. Have you, since the Violence Project concluded, been awarded funding to now implement those findings? Yes, I recently received an award in collaboration with the St. Paul Public Schools, a $1 million grant through the Bureau of Justice Assistance to implement some of those findings and conclusions in the St. Paul Public School system. Dr. Peterson, are you invited to speak around the country regarding mass shooting research and mass shooting prevention? I am, yes. What sort of organizations invite you to speak? All sorts, um, teachers, educators, um, medical, law enforcement, FBI, Homeland Security. Now, is that, that's in regards to your mass shooting research, correct? Yes. Okay, your experience in this, in this study is extensive, so I, I just want to recap, and please let me know if I'm missing anything. You began your career building life histories while working with inmates on death row in New York? Yes. You obtained your PhD, then started in research? Yes. Around 2017, your research focused on mass shooting prevention? Yes. You have published multiple works on the subject, is that right? Yes. You've been awarded two competitive grants, one to build a database, another to implement the findings? Yes. You've written a book on the subject. Yes. And you are invited to speak around the country to law enforcement and other organizations to discuss how to prevent mass shootings. Yes. Now, earlier you mentioned that you were looking for patterns when you conducted analysis of the data. Correct. 
So yes. Through it all, the, the violence project, when the violence project concluded up to this day, tell the court what you've discovered. Sure, we discovered a consistent pathway that often started with early childhood trauma that included things like physical or sexual abuse, chaotic households, neglect. There was a slow build over time up to what we call a crisis point. That crisis point is often a suicidal <coughs> crisis where the perpetrator is hopeless and isolated and no longer cares if they live or die. During that crisis point, their behavior is changing. So they're acting differently and people around them are noticing that they're acting differently. During that period, they're often studying other perpetrators. We call this social proof. So they look for models of behavior. Oftentimes they identify with previous shooters and see themselves in those previous shooters. During this period of time, they also often leak their plans. So leakage refers to any communication of an intent to do harm. So they are having indicators of violence um, and showing those to people. And then finally, they have access to the guns that they need to do the shooting and to the location, which it represents their grievance with the world. Now these findings, these patterns, is this what you term the pathway of violence? Yes. Did you see some of the same steps in the pathway of violence in this particular case? I did. Okay, before we get into that, is every life history is unique, right? Yes. Okay, so when you talk about childhood trauma, you're not here to suggest that every kid who had it rough is gonna turn into a mass shooter. Absolutely not. Okay. In fact, you aren't here to testify regarding prediction at all. Is that right? Right. And I want to make clear that there is a difference between prediction and prevention. Correct. Can you tell me, please, what that means? Yes, we can't predict who is going to become a mass shooter using the variables that we've studied. What we can do is identify patterns in the data that allow us to design prevention. So if someone has experienced childhood trauma, they could turn out just fine. They could have a variety of different maladaptive outcomes. Um, but if you're being there, you're preventing all of those things. So if there's a pattern for these mass shooting events, that means there's opportunity to stop. Yes. Do you follow other research in this area as well? Yes. Now you mentioned the process behind a peer reviewed journal. Are you asked to review other researchers for their own peer review? Yes, quite often. So you are recognized as an expert in this field? Yes. And do you collaborate with other researchers in this field? I do, yes. And do you keep abreast of other violence prevention programs? Yes. Now, to your knowledge, has any other person who studies mass shootings ever come to a different conclusion than there is a consistent pathway to violence? Not to my knowledge, no. Has anyone ever come to a conclusion other than mass shootings are preventable? No. Has anyone ever come to a conclusion that mass shooters don't stand? Um, no. Now this holds law enforcement agencies that conduct research as well as academic researchers, is that right? Correct. Now you have authored a report in this case. Yes. May I approach one? Sure. This has been admitted as people's two. And that is admitted as evidence, so feel free to refer if you would like to. <clears throat> now, I'd like just to refer you to the first line here. Can you just read the first line for the court? Sure. It says, there is a common misconception by the general public that mass shooters are evil monsters who simply snap and commit a shooting one day. But the research has consistently demonstrated that there is a common pathway to violence for mass shooters. Now, this is, as you testified, you're familiar with uh, the FBI's research. Yes. In fact, have you read the 2018 study by the FBI in pre-attack behavior? Yes. And in their own introductory paragraph, they found the same conclusion. Would that be right? Yes. You didn't term, or you didn't coin the term pathway to violence. I didn't, no. Okay. Do other researchers use that term as well? Yes. Do they use it in the same way you do? Slightly different? And tell us how so. Slightly different. So the term was originally coined by two researchers, Weston and Calhoun, back in 2003. Um, our pathway to violence starts earlier, essentially. So we were interested in childhood and adolescence and that slow build. That other pathway to violence starts at the grievance point, so closer to the mass shooting, but they're very consistent. 
Okay. Now, your research starts earlier because you endeavor to study life histories. Would that be right? Yes. Now, is it fair to say in building this database and examining the variables, coding the variables, you've sought every piece of information possible? Yes. I want to go back to the findings for just a minute. You mentioned crisis. Yes. Okay. And tell me, please, again, what, what is a crisis point? Like? So we define a crisis point as when your current circumstances are overwhelming your ability to cope. Um, something pushes you over the edge. It could be the loss of a job or the loss of a relationship. Um, and then you start acting differently. So we call it a marked change in behavior from baseline. Um, the most common thing we see is increased agitation, increased isolation, increased abusive behavior. It could be not turning in homework assignments or not showing up for school, but people around you are noticing that something's different. Now, this could look different for the individual, correct? It looks different in each individual, yes. <clears throat> tell, me, tell me, Corey, again, please, what's leakage? Leakage is communication of attempt to do harm or of intent to do harm to a third party. Would you consider leakage to be one of the more important factors in the study of mass research or mass shooting research? Yeah, we've discovered that leakage is a really critical intervention point. Um, one study we did found that leakage is really a cry for help. And so that becomes the key point at which someone needs to intervene. Okay. And that is because of the nature of the fact that leakage is communicated to another party. Exactly. Yes. Can it be intentionally communicated as well as unintentionally communicated? Yes. And tell me about that, please. It could be an intentional communication. So writing something on social media, like I'm going to be a school shooter. It could be something more subtle, maybe unintentional, like drawing guns on pieces of paper or something. Now, how, how prevalent is an identifiable crisis point in mass shooters? We found it in 85% of the cases we studied. Okay, so pretty consistent throughout all 185 or so. Yes. What about leakage? So we found leakage, if you look at the whole sample, which includes uh, workplace shooters, restaurant shooters, retail shooters, we see it in about 50% of cases. If we isolate just the K through 12 school mass shooters, we see it 93% of the time. Did you see evidence of a crisis point in this case? Yes. Tell me, please. Um, in the evidence I reviewed, I saw two different crisis points. One around March, uh, when the perpetrator was talking about um, potential hallucinations, delusions, needing mental health care, um, even thinking about calling 911 on himself in order to get mental health care. And then a second crisis point in the month before the shooting, when his behavior was changing, his best friend had been sent away, um, I believe his dog had died. He was um, acting differently during that period as well. Okay. And you reviewed some of the evidence in this case as well, right? It did. Okay. And, and did you review the journal? It did. Did that have evidence of the crisis point as well? Yes. Um, there was a lot in that journal that indicated that he was in a crisis. <laughs> now, you mentioned that mass shooters often are suicidal. Yes. Okay. Now, when you say that, does that mean that every shooter intends to kill himself or herself? So mass shootings are what is called a performance crime. So the shooting is meant to be watched. It's meant to be witnessed by the world. It's a way to get your anger and grievance into the headlines. It's a way to get your name into the history books. It's a way to be seen. And so in order to do that, you have to either be killed or be caught. So mass shooters don't have an escape plan. They go in knowing that this is their final act. So in many cases, they go in planning to die in the shooting. In some rare cases, they go in planning to spend the rest of their lives in prison. Okay. Did you see evidence in that in this case? Yes. And what was that? Um, the perpetrator indicated that he planned to spend the rest of his life in prison for this. What about the concept of social proof? Can you talk to me a little bit more about that, please? Yeah, social proof is studying previous perpetrators, um, getting radicalized in online groups or on message boards, um, kind of identifying and seeing yourself in those other previous perpetrators. And that was also found in this case, am I correct? Yes. Now let's talk about, about leakage. You mentioned it was, it was critically important. And yes. You had, like I said, you had the opportunity to review some of the evidence in this case? I did. I would like to refer you to the book exhibit 
four and five both have been admitted. Do you we approach that? Sure. Dr. Peterson, if you could just take a moment to look at People's Exhibit 5. Do you recognize that? I do. And I, I'm sorry, 4 and 5. Do you recognize both of those? I do. Now, when you talk about, about leakage and, and it being prevalent, especially in school shooting, I want you to tell the court, is this an example of leakage? It is, yes. Okay. And, and tell me what you found in this case, your review of this case, in regards to leakage. So this case, compared to the other um, K through 12 school shooters that I've studied, this case was remarkable just in the sheer volume of leakage in the month leading up to the shooting, um, including homework assignments, journals, notebooks at home, internet searches during school, and then of course this worksheet the day of the shooting. Okay, that worksheet that I just handed you, people's four and five, is that significant to you? Yes, it is. How so? Um, all of this is leakage from the gun to the thoughts won't stop. Um, in our research, we typically have to infer that leakage is a cry for help. And in here, it literally says, help me. Now, it's, it's important that leakage is um, evaluated in the context of the person receiving the leakage. Is that right? Yes. So some people who have more information are able to interpret it better. Yes. Would it be fair to say that the evidence you reviewed in this case demonstrated an escalating crisis? Yes. Now, what about evidence of opportunity? You talked about opportunity. So we define opportunity as two things, access to the weapon and access to the chosen location. And did the shooter in this case have both of those? Yes. Now, tell us, Dr. Peterson, in what you reviewed in this case, is it consistent or inconsistent with what your studies have found? Um, really, the pathway that the perpetrator went down in this case is very consistent with um, other perpetrators of K-12 school mass shootings. There are a couple differences in this case, one being the sheer volume of leakage, second being how he obtained the weapon, um, and I guess third being the fact that the leakage was discussed the day of the shooting. Were there opportunities to interview? Yes. Okay, one moment, Rob. Sure. Thank you, Judge. Nothing further. We just have a two-minute break, please. Okay. Um, we can even leave them at the table. Get our clients at this table. Okay. Let me say, tell me what kind of a break you want. You want? Do you want your um, clients to get upstairs? Do you want to walk into the hallway? Do you want no. Myself and co-counsel need to walk into the hallway, walk into the bathroom, and then walk right back here. Okay. So they can. Our clients can stay here. Okay. That's okay. Okay. Is that all right? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Thanks.
I'm going to take a picture in here. You can't take a picture in here. Okay. It's a video or a picture in here. I'm going to confiscate your phone. Deputies, if you if you observe someone taking a picture or videotaping in here, you can let me know and I will personally not speak it. Begins. I know council mentioned in the opening, um, but just so the record is clear that this witness is stipulated to be an expert in the field of mass shootings. That's correct. So I, I just want to repeat something I said earlier. Um, allowing cell phones into the courtroom is uh, fairly new and frankly a little bit controversial. Um, but these proceedings are not uh, permitted to be photographed or videotaped in any way. Um, as you see, there are a number of deputies here who will be permitted to confiscate your phone. And you have to take a, uh, a video or a picture. It's not committed inside the courtroom, right? You know, probably you don't know that, but it's, it's not committed, right? Thank you. Can I go across? Thank you. Um, good morning, Dr. Peterson. Good morning. My name is Shannon Smith. I represent Jennifer Crumley. Um, today, when I'm asking questions, if anything's confusing, please <clears throat> stop me, let me know. Um, if I confuse you with a question, I'd rather clear it up and have you guess. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, okay. So I'm going to jump right into my understanding is that there are two main areas you would testify to in this case. One being the issue that shooters, um, don't just snap. And the second being that. Uh, school shootings can be preventable. Is that correct? I'm not sure. I can testify more than that. Okay. I'm going to go with the, I'm going to start with talking about um, school, school shooter snapping first with respect to uh, this instant case. Um, in this case, you reviewed a number of materials um, dating back through 2021 um, authored by and written by Ethan Crumbly, correct? Correct. So you saw journal entries he wrote, text messages he sent, internet searches he did, um, all kinds of things along those lines. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And it would be fair to say that anyone who sees all the evidence, all the things he was doing, it's very clear he was planning this, contemplating it, thinking about it. This was something Ethan thought about, correct? It's clear that there was an escalation up to the shooting, yes. Okay, and it's it's not something, I mean, there's, it's not, it's, it's not even a question. He's specific about it being a school shooting he wants to commit, correct? Yes. 
he's specific about even some of the targets that he would want to shoot first to get the most attention. Yes. He's specific about wanting to spend the rest of his life in prison. Yes. Okay, so all of the things that with Ethan, it's yeah, very- Have we agreed to call him the Sherry? Yes. Well, I'm sorry. Thank you, Justin. I'm sorry. Thank you. It's easy to, it, it's, there's no question the shooter planned the shooting and did things um, to accomplish that plan, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, the second area, at least, that the defense understands the prosecution intends to um, elicit testimony about is the prevent preventability, I don't know if that's a word, of mass shootings or of school shootings. And your testimony was that um, school shootings are preventable. Yes. Is it your position that all school shootings are preventable? Yes. Okay. With, is it your position that all school shootings are preventable if leakage and risk factors are identified and there's some kind of interception? Is that my understanding of what you're saying makes it preventable? So prevention could happen at any point along that pathway to violence, yes. Okay, and you're on Twitter, is that correct? Yes. Okay, and back in May, you tweeted that two thirds of school shootings are preventable. Do you recall tweeting that? No. Um, may I approach the witness, Your Honor, and I'll show. If you were shown um, how could you tweet, would it possibly refresh your recollection? Yes. Does seeing that refresh your recollection? No, I didn't tweet this. I don't run the Violence Project Twitter account, but. Okay, but somebody somebody from your project um, tweeted, two thirds of mass shootings are preventable. Do you have any idea where they got this two thirds number from? I don't actually. Okay, and your testimony is that 100% of shootings are preventable. At some point along the pathway to violence, yes. Just so we're clear, counsel referring to school shootings, is that right? Yes. We have obviously seen a number of school shootings. Yes. And there is, the research does not contain school shootings that were in fact prevented through the pathways to violence methods, correct? It's very hard to study. There are some studies of averted shootings, but it's very hard to know the scope of shootings that were prevented. So in the end, when it's your opinion that all of them can be prevented, we don't have any scientific data that confirms they can all be prevented. We have a common pathway to violence and we have studies of shootings. We have, we have a lot of information and we have hope that more information will help us identify shooters and shootings, but we have no concrete way to know that we are going to be able to stop all shootings, correct? <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry, Judge. I need to, to uh, Jeff, just to clarify, counsel again said all shootings. All and school Dr. shootings. Dr. Peterson's an expert in mass shootings. Yeah, I mean, you can ask both ways. But, um, I apologize. Just, no, just be clear. Yeah. Okay. Obviously, the information, the goal is to identify and to, to stop school shootings and reduce the numbers of school shootings. But right now, there is not concrete evidence that shows if X, Y, and Z is done, a school shooting will never happen in a school, correct? 
there's data to show that certain prevention strategies do prevent shootings. But if what you're saying is, I mean, we can't like randomize people and run experiments. So right. I yeah. my, I guess my point is that we have a we have a ways to go on research and getting more information, <laughs> collecting more data, and finding ways that we can um, intercept and stop shootings. I would say the information we have is pretty good at this point. We just need to get it out there. Okay. And when you're talking about getting the information out there, much of what you work on is getting this information into the hands of school officials, school administration, um, and people uh, who work with students. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. The bulk of your um, the work you do is to help schools find ways to recognize leakage, to address a student's uh, mental health needs or, or maybe just needs or whatever it's going to take, and to help schools stop the shooting from taking place. Schools and other practitioner groups, yes. You do not do trainings um, that are where parents solely for parents to come and learn about leakage and learn about how to stop school shootings, correct? I have done trainings just for parents, yes. Okay, but the bulk of your work is on uh, schools and school employees, is that fair to say? No. Okay, what is the bulk of your work then? The bulk of the training that I do. Um, different practitioner groups, um, law enforcement, um, reporters. I do a lot of work with schools, but I wouldn't say it's the bulk, no. Okay, so law enforcement, um, reporters, the um, some of the parents are can be a part of it. You're trying to target the classes of people that would have the contact with children to be able to make a difference. Is that fair to say? Yes, anyone who has regular contact with young people. Okay, and you did a study. Um, <clears throat> A, a more recent study about experts um, being able to assess shooting threats. Is that correct? Yes, it's currently under review. Okay, so you did research to determine, one of the questions you're asking and trying to determine is, um, why aren't experts better at assessing school uh, shooting threats, correct? Yes, why are they inconsistent? Okay, and one of the things that you found, so when you're dealing with this study, um, I'll say it as I understand it, but please stop me if I'm wrong. You surveyed 229 senior law enforcement officials and officers, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. And those uh, law enforcement officials and officers, they were people who are directly responsible to assess threats um, that could be in a school shooting. Is that correct? Yes. Or in a potential school shooting? Yes. And the research asked these senior level officials and officers to use a scale of one to 10 and look at materials and determine on a one to 10 level um, if it was to rate the severity of what they were seeing. Is that correct? Yes. So for example, you would give them a, a drawing, you know, a hypothetical drawing that a student did, and then you ask all 100, 229 people, rate this drawing on a scale of one to 10, how um, severe of a threat is this, correct? Yes. And one example um, is you guys had a drawing. It was a stick figure that was portraying a school shooting um, in a trash can. That was just one example of a material you used to give to these investigators and say, assess the risk, correct? Correct. And these trained senior law enforcement officials and officers um, 
scored the, the drawing. And on that one in particular, 62% of the experts rated the threat as low, correct? Yes. They scored it between a one and a three out of 10. Yes. And then only 27 of the 229 scored it as an eight or higher, correct? Yes. So even trained senior law enforcement officials, there is not consistency among them when they look at a drawing or a piece of information to determine the risk level, correct? piece of information no other context and without knowing anything about the student or anything about the situation then that is correct yes okay and so there's also questions that need to be researched about how to weigh the severity of threats made on social media that's something else to be considered correct yes and this study that you did um, shows that it highlights the dire need that we need to keep studying this and we need to come up with some guidelines, right? Yes. And that's a work in progress through today and into the future, correct? Yes. There was also another, um, example in the study where there were photographs of classmates and it looked like there was either a gun or a heart emoji posted on Snapchat with the student's face, correct? Yes. And on that one, 45% of the experts assessed that to be a low threat between a one and a three, correct? Yes. And only 15 of the two, in 15 of the 229 rated it an eight or higher. Yes. Okay, so again, there is not consistency even among highly trained experienced officers on the risk level when it comes to looking at a piece of information. Inconsistency on the risk level, but there was a lot more consistency in how they would respond and investigate. Okay, and one of the one of the benefits we have after, uh, I guess a benefit, um, after a school shooting has taken place is the ability to look backwards at what could have been done, what should have been done, what wasn't done, correct? It's true. And, um, and unfortunately, there's no way to predict these things in advance. And let me, let me be more specific you don't have a checklist of the criteria of what makes a school shooter, correct? Correct. The, all of the factors you talked about in the database show there's many contributing factors that can be looked at, but there is, there's not a profile of this is gonna be somebody who should be on our radar as a school shooter. There's no profile, but there is a pathway and leakage being the most critical component of that pathway. So I, I'm gonna ask you, I, I'll turn to um, leakage. When you're talking about leakage, um, the drawing Ethan drew that's been admitted um, as ex I think exhibit five, those drawings, um, were identified by you as leakage um, after the crime took place, correct? Yes. Now, if I had drawn those same drawings, but did not commit a shooting in a school, it would not be considered leakage. It would be considered leakage. It's any communication of intent to do harm. Okay, so any communication of intent to do harm including times when harm is not done, all counts. Correct, that type of drawing would be something you would want to investigate and intervene with, regardless of what the intended outcome was gonna be. Yes. The, it, 
in putting together, in looking at the leakage though, one of you, part of your definition is that it is, it goes to a third party, correct? Yes. We're not talking about documents that are hidden that only the shooter sees, right. correct? And your testimony in this case was that there was a lot of leakage by the shooter yes. and um, two third parties. That third parties were made aware of, yes. Okay. Now, when you looked at the materials, um, and I imagine they were provided from the prosecution. Yes. You looked through, um, I'm just gonna go through some of the materials, okay? Okay. You looked through some of Ethan Crumbly's notebooks from home, correct? Yes. You have no knowledge of who saw the contents of that notebook. I don't know. So if there's no, if we don't know who saw it, if there, we don't know there was a third party, do you still consider it leakage? Depends on where the notebook was left in the home. Okay, so the notebooks from home, you have nothing to show that that mom or dad saw those notebooks um, or wrote anything in those notebooks to Ethan about what he wrote, correct? I, no. There was a journal that Ethan wrote in, um, it looks like November of 2021. You have no information, and you said that was leakage, correct? It was leakage because the evidence shows he was writing it in class, in public, in front of in his house, right? It wasn't something he kept hidden. You have no information, though, showing that the le that, that leakage was seen by Jennifer or James Crumbly, correct? I don't. There were a number of text messages that you saw between the shooter and a friend of his who's also a minor, so I'm not going to say his name. And certainly in those text messages, there was leakage where the shooter wrote out some of his plans, correct? Yes. And you have no evidence to show that James or Jennifer Crumbly ever saw those text messages, correct? I don't know. And when the shooter in this case says things, um, to a third party, so for example, to his friend, saying, I asked my mom and dad about blah, 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 going to a doctor, whatever. You don't know if that's a true statement that that really happened, or if that's just something the shooter is saying to his friend on a text. I only have the materials I reviewed. Now, very early on in this case, um, you heard about the Oxford uh, shooting right away as it happened, I imagine. Yes. And um, you wrote an op-ed piece very early on in the case about some of the distinctions between um, this case and other school shootings. Is that correct? I believe so, yes. And. Um, the op-ed piece was actually written like the first week of December, so within about a week after the shooting took place. Yes. And at that point, had you been in touch with the prosecution regarding this case? No. In the op-ed piece you wrote, um, one of the items that you seem firm on is that you believe that Ethan was given access to the gun by his parents. Is that a fair statement? Yes. And in your report, um, some of your opinions rely on the fact that you believe Ethan was given that Ethan was given access. Okay. It's following the shooting. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I, I, I know. I know. It's an I'm... Okay that the shooter was given access to the gun by his parents. 
for the op-ed, I was relying on previously published news accounts of what had happened. So those accounts are linked within the op-ed. And for the reports, it references the Instagram posts and things that I relied on. Okay. And <laughs> one of the... You would agree with me that sometimes the news, God bless them, does not accurately report um, what's happening in a case or accurately report the details of a crime, things like that, correct? Um, not 100% of the time, right? Okay. And that's actually one of the limitations, even in your work in compiling the database, is that you have to rely on information given to you by other people that you can't always independently verify, correct? We triangulate sources with um, firsthand and primary sources whenever we can, but yes, there's cases where we do use secondary sources. And in, um, for example, one of your published studies about the communication of intent to do harm before a mass shooting, um, you identify the limitations of your of your study, correct? Yes, that's a required part of the peer review process. And part of the limitations in the what you rely on include things like there's room for bias. There's room for bias, is that correct? Yes. And it's fair to say that if the initial information you were prevented showed that Jennifer and James, or led you to believe Jennifer and James Crumbly gave the shooter the gun, that creates, we can agree that would create some bias in your mind about these parents. Um, I guess I would just was relying on the evidence that I was provided in the report. In the limitation section of your article, um, you note that there's sometimes misinformation because the source data was originally gathered for purposes different from our own. So the database that you have right now, some of the data in there was derived from databases that were created for other reasons. Is that correct? Yes, which is standard practice in our field. And there were situations where you write, it's possible there was leakage but information was not made publicly available for you to be able to look at. Yes. And in trying to look at the database and create it and compile it, um, there's times where you hit some roadblocks like HIPAA getting in the way of getting medical records and things like that, correct? Yes. And there's, um, there's all, it's also difficult when we talk about HIPAA, um, to get mental health services information because the mental health services a perpetrator may have might be related to the shooting or it might be related to something else, correct? Yes. So it's so there's some question about, there's some room for um, parts of the database that we cannot say are 100% reliable. That's true of all research in this area, but yes, we used as many sources as we could find. The, in your book, um, There's an example um, about a kid who uh, got a pie from someone. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay. So there was, my understanding is there was someone who was planning to commit a mass shooting. Is that correct? Yes. And they had a friend who was making a pie for them. Yes. And they claimed that because somebody cared about them and was making the pie for them, that stopped them from committing the shooting, correct? Yes, it gave them hope and got them through their crisis point. Okay, and part of what you hope to see is administrators, school officials, helping students get through their crisis point, 
as a way, as a means to block and stop a mass shooting from happening, a school shooting, correct? Yes. Okay. When it comes to the example with the pie, we don't have any independent facts showing that this person had the plans and the gun and the materials and all of the things to truly commit the shooting, correct? Um, that's a first-hand account, so we just have his first-hand account. Okay, so his first-hand account could be true that this idea somebody made him a pie stopped him from shooting, um, or it could be a feel-good story that he tells. Is that a fair statement? Um, I mean, in terms of collecting interview data and analyzing it for kind of social science purposes, yes, you would try to triangulate that with independent sources if you could. And the pie example is, is one of the ones you use to show that sometimes it's little actions that can help stop a shooting, but that example, we don't really have much information about it to show that a pie is going to stop every shooter, correct? That is one anecdote in the book. There are others, yes. At the end of the day, um, every shooter is different and has a different background um, and, different, and different plans, is that correct? Yes. And there is no recipe for us to put in place to guarantee that we're going to be able to prevent um, future shootings. I'd say there is a recipe we could put in place. There's a recipe we could put in place and hopefully minimize it, but we, we don't have any proof yet that this is definitely gonna work. It's gonna stop all school shootings. We do not have that data. Now, one of the things that does make a big difference is when there's kind of an intervention or law enforcement becomes involved um, in, in finding out there's plans uh, in the works for a school shooting. Is that a fair, that's a horrible question. Okay, let me back up. Okay, on Monday of this week, there was a school shooting in St. Louis. Are you familiar with the, that school shooting? I have read just the news coverage, I haven't studied it. Okay, in that school shooting, um, there was, the police had had the gun the week before. Are you aware of that? Uh, I read that in an article. Are you aware that the shooter in that case had been committed, um, had a mental health commitment prior to the shooting? That is not a case I have studied, I'm afraid. Okay. I guess the bottom line of what I'm asking you is even sometimes when there are interventions and things done, a school shooting can still happen. I have, if, if we're talking about that case, I haven't studied it. Okay, the Parkland shooter. You've studied the Parkland shooter. Yes. He's part of the book, mm -hmm. okay? We can agree he was on the FBI radar prior to the shooting. Yes. And with him being on the FBI radar, he was still able and did commit a violent school shooting. Correct. There was a lot of missed warning signs in that case. With the database that you have prepared, you have already added Ethan Crumbly to the database. Yes. And one of the uh, check marks that Ethan Crumbly is checked up off on is that he was neglected as a child. Are you aware of that? Um, I have. I wasn't one of the original coders, so no. Okay. But I'd have to look at the, the data. So in terms of what data would support that Ethan Crumbly was neglected as a child, Judge again. if you know. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to get I, I know it's hard to avoid. Please don't mention. 
at this moment. Oh God, sorry. Okay. Thank you. I, I think it just, I think it's upsetting for the, for the victims. I apologize for that. I know you don't mean it. 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 We, those were, that case was coded by two independent coders using publicly available information. So I'd have to gather this source files, but we do, we know that the best data about each case doesn't become available until sort of two or three years later, oftentimes when FBI reports and things are released. So that's when we go back and we make sure we're revising the data. Okay, so the data is always subject to be revised when you have more information down the road as things continue. Yes. And um, it's fair to say that one person, I know you have two coders, but if there has never been a history of abuse or neglect, um, police phone calls, things like that, um, one person's opinion about whether Ethan was neglected could be different than another person's. Is that a fair statement? No, it's based on data, which two people code and then a third person checks. Okay, and specifically in this case with the shooter, you you don't have an awareness of what data was used to make that conclusion. I don't know. Trying to see if I have anything else. Um, in your work, interviewing people who were related to other mass shooters, have you interviewed any persons? who said, I knew the shooting was going to happen, or I knew the perpetrator was going to commit this school shooting? I, I'm not trying to understand the question. Have you had any people who know these perpetrators say, I knew he was going to do this before he did it? Oh, I see. Um, interviewed people who have said, I was very worried, but not that said, I knew a school shooting was gonna happen on this day. Okay. And in any of those cases that you have looked into with the perpetrators, um, and I know you said there's only 30 alive, and so it makes it difficult because some are not here any longer. Um, are there any cases where parents were criminally charged With, with, in connection with the perpetrators in your database? Yes. Not, not with manslaughter, I don't believe. Okay. Not with manslaughter, but other, what type, what crimes? Um, I believe sort of buying a gun for a minor. Okay. Outside of buying a gun for a minor or violations of state safe storage laws in states that have those, um, you have not had experience working on cases aside from this one where parents are accused of involuntary manslaughter for the actions of their child. No. I have nothing further at this at this time. Thank you, Ms. Lina. Thank you, Honor. <laughs> Dr. Peterson, I'm going to go back a little bit in your direct testimony with Mr. Keast. You testified, um, and I, I'm going to paraphrase what you said, but you testified that you wanted your database and your book and your various studies to be publicly available. Is that right? Yes. And the reason that you wanted them to be publicly available was because you wanted to, I believe you said, make a difference. Yes. 
And in making a difference, you wanted to educate people. Yes. And you wanted to educate people on what you have identified as the various steps in the pathway to violence. Yes. Now it's, it's your understanding based on your studies and based on your reviews um, that the majority of people don't know what the steps are on the pathway to violence. Um, true, yes. And in this case in particular, you haven't reviewed anything. Um, Ms. Smith went over what you reviewed to write your report. You haven't reviewed anything or provided any information that James or Jennifer Crumbly had ever been advised on what the pathway, the steps on the pathway to violence are. Is that accurate? Yes. And to your knowledge, you don't know that they're even aware of what the pathway to violence is. Yes. So it's fair to say that even though you have found that there was a crisis point, you identified, I believe, two crisis points with the shooter in this case, um, you identified that there was leakage in this case, in your opinion, um, you can't you wouldn't be able to testify that either James nor Jennifer Crumbly knew what those things were, that there were crisis points or that there was leakage and that they should intervene. Is that fair? I don't think you have to know the term leakage to see leakage and be concerned. But a common person wouldn't know what those things are or that there was a need to intervene a common person seeing that math drawing, I, I guess I disagree. Okay, a common person wouldn't know that that's leakage. They would know that it's cause for intervention and concern, I would think. So they might know that it's a problem, but they wouldn't know that it's leakage, that there would be a mass shooting. They wouldn't know that it was the term leakage, no. You testified with, um, on your cross-examination with Ms. Smith, and I believe also with Mr. Keese, that the data in this case that you compiled and that the Violence Project compiled was based on publicly available data. True. And specific to this case, you wrote your report, and I believe Ms. Smith asked about an op-ed that you wrote based on what was publicly available. This report, no. I'm sorry, this report was based on what the prosecution provided to you. Correct. Your opinion, um, that you wrote shortly after the shooting in this case was based on what was publicly available. Yes. And is it fair to say that what was publicly available would be what you find on the internet? Um, no, things that are published in reputable sources. Okay. So we talked about media reports. Correct. And that would also be interviews that you observe. Uh, correct. Interviews with the prosecutor. Um, if it was recorded in the media, yes. In the purpose of your research, I think you said that you started with mitigation in the New York Defender's Office and mitigating um, cases involving the death penalty. Right. Yes. And then you moved uh, in 2017, you, your, your path kind of, um, I don't want to say it moved around, but it evolved. Yes. And you chose to focus on how to intervene to prevent mass shootings. Yes. And that began in 2017. Yes. Okay. And so the purpose of your research and your studies since 2017 has been to identify ways to prevent a mass shooting. And I think we, we covered this a minute ago, and one of the ways that you believe you can prevent mass shootings is by educating the masses. Yes. And I believe you, you testified with Ms. Smith that the majority of your, your um, education of the masses that you've done personally has been with law enforcement officials, right? And school officials, school administration, um, people of, of that, nature. Is that fair to say? Yes. Um, you testified that you have done some trainings with parents, right? Yes. You didn't train James or Jennifer Crumbly, is that right? Not that I'm aware. You haven't reviewed anything in this case, and it's also fair to say you didn't interview the shooter in this case. Um, you weren't able to independently verify any of the information that was provided to you by the prosecutor's office. 
um, the evidence that was provided to me. Correct. Correct. So you didn't interview anyone to determine whether or not what was provided to you or what's been said about this case was actually accurate. Uh, no, I didn't have that opportunity. <clears throat> And I don't recall if I answered this, and if I did, I apologize. Um, you haven't been provided any information that James or Jennifer Crumbly would know how to identify any of the steps on what you've identified as a pathway to violence. I'm not sure what you mean. Okay. You haven't been provided any information that James or Jennifer Crumbly, I'll take it a step back, know what the pathway to violence is. <clears throat> yes. That's accurate. You don't? Accurate. Okay. And you don't know that they know that there are steps to the pathway to violence. Right. And you don't know whether they were able to identify any of those steps. Correct. You acknowledge, I believe you acknowledge with Ms. Smith that there were others who may have been made aware of what the shooter had been planning. Yes. Okay. And that would be a friend, correct? Yes. And there were school officials teachers, yes, um, a number of people who you were able to identify who actually did know what um, the shooter was planning. I, would, I don't know if they knew what he was planning, but who saw the leakage. Who saw the leakage. And is it fair to say that, um, and you may not be able to answer this, but in this day and age, in the age of what you have identified as a prevalence of mass shootings, and I think we agree that there is a prevalence of mass shootings, that school officials, teachers, law enforcement officials, those are people who are more readily able to identify things such as leakage or crisis points or things of that nature. Is that a fair statement? As compared to? The general public and lay people who have never had. Um, I would say as compared to family and people close to the shooter, no. But compared to lay people with no training, yes. It's also fair to say that any review that you've done um, during your research or your studies, or even the review in this case, everything is done in hindsight. Yes. And it's fair to say a lot easier to identify things in hindsight than when they're actually occurring. Is that fair? That's fair. Thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Josh. <clears throat> you were asked if any other parents in your study have been charged with any crimes in relation to mass or school shootings. Remember that question? I do. And you thought that perhaps no other parents in the country were charged in voluntary manslaughter in the circumstance. Yes. Okay. What's different about this case? Um, the differences in this case are the sheer volume of leakage, the fact that the parents were called to the school and made aware of the leakage the day of the shooting, and the fact that as far as the evidence I've reviewed, they knew that the perpetrator had access to an unsecured weapon. Now, it's fair to say that anyone can prevent a mass shooting. Is that right? Yes. Okay, we're not talking about predict. We're talking about prevention. Correct. Okay, you were asked about that study of uh, 229 law enforcement officials who were shown certain documents and then asked if this tells them a school shooting is going to occur. Do you recall that? Yes. Okay. And is it fair to say that those individuals were shown um, pieces of leakage in a vacuum? Exactly. Okay, what do I mean by that? It means they saw that piece of leakage and they had no context about the person who made the leakage, um, their background, their circumstances, their access to weapons. We actually got a lot of pushback from the people involved in that study because they wanted more information to be able to evaluate it. Okay, so just as your last answer, one of your last answers like cross-examination was that people close to a shooter, family or friends who have the eye, the ability to detect crisis point and leakage, those are the people in the best position to prevent a mass shooting. Would it be true that seeing a piece of leakage in a vacuum doesn't really do a lot of good? Right, you need to gather as much information as possible and the people closest to the perpetrator are going to have the most information. But even that little exhibits, exhibits four and five, even if you just saw that exhibit in a vacuum, does that, does that um, indicate something that should be done next to you? You know, looking at this specific 
piece of leakage in a vacuum, I would say this would be a high risk in any circumstance. So when you look at that exhibit in particular, if there is somebody to view that particular exhibit who also knows that the person who drew that picture has a firearm that looks identical to that firearm, who also begged for that firearm, who knows how to use that firearm and received that firearm just four days prior, that's information only known to that person, correct? Correct. So that's all information in a context would be pretty important to you. Yes. Okay, and you don't need to actually understand the definition of crisis point or the definition of leakage to know it's time to intervene. Yes. Okay, so you're not gonna testify that you need a PhD to stop a school shooting, right? No. Why? Um, anyone can stop a school shooting. If we see leakage, if we know there's access to a weapon, if we know that a young person is in crisis, that's, that's the time to intervene. Now you were asked about how you gather your data and, and how the, the violence project was was formed and, and it relied in part on open sources. Yes. Okay, and tell me about the practice of using open sources in studies such as mass shooting prevention. Open sources are a very um, common methodology to use. And in fact, there's been studies to show that open sources are sometimes more reliable than FBI files just because of what actually ends up getting reported. Um, so there's limitations to open sources, but the goal is triangulation. So you take um, as many pieces of information as you can coming from a combination of primary and secondary sources and try to make sure whatever you're reporting is um, valid from a number of different sources. Okay, and the fact that mass shootings, in particular school, school shootings, are very heavily reported, does that give you a little bit of uh, reassurance when you look at a media report? Yes, so the reason, one of the reasons we chose four more people killed is because those are the shootings that get a lot of media coverage, so you can get a lot of information. In the Violence Project database, it, you, you indicated that you may enter an event, but you go back and you, you check the data over the next two or three years. Yes, we know that the best data comes two or three years down the line after a trial has come out or after an FBI investigation. So we do continually update the data. Now, you were asked a question about the antidote in your book um, regarding a potential school shooter who was given a pie. And that, that small act of kindness, that changed that pathway to violence. Yes. So it's your research, your findings that even something small can prevent a school shooting? Yes. Especially if somebody knew about Crisis Point? And knew what was going on in that person's life? Yes. Nothing further. I'm usually looking at um, allow Ray Cross, but if you have any questions, I will allow that. No, Your Honor, I do not. Thank you. <coughs> Nothing, Your Honor. Very good. Thank you. Does anybody need a break before the rest of the Does anybody need a break before? Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm going to ask everybody to remain seated, please. Okay. We're going to take a break for assess kind of 15 minutes. Is there, is there one person on one right? Yes, yes, Sean. Yeah. Correct, Sean. All right, so the um, court will be in recess for about 10 or 15 minutes. Thank you, Judge. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, should we wait for her? Oh, no, you're, you're okay, good. We'll sit. Thank you so much. Do you want to show? Should we sit in your seat? You're good. I just said that. PhD to recognize them or a microscope? No. Are mass shootings preventable? Yes. <coughs> Dr. Cornell, I want to hand you a copy of your curriculum vitae. Got one with you. Thank you. There's this exhibit three in the binder where this admission has been stipulated. Dr. Cornell, is that your CV? Yes, it is. I want to briefly review that with you. Doctor, where did you um, receive your graduate degrees? I attended the University of Michigan and obtained my uh, master's and PhD there. And uh, doctor, you said you're currently employed at uh, the University of Virginia.